And this workshop uh, is organized uh, by the education community of ITB MCT at EDCOM. Uh, and uh, I think the most education resources for our uh, undergraduate students. Uh, uh, so, uh, we keep our great honor in invite three distinguished uh, microwave uh, professors. So, here I, I would like to introduce our three distinguished microwave instructors. The first one is uh, hi, uh, yeah. I can't hear clearly from your side. Maybe I'm not sure if others can hear clearly. You you cannot see. Uh, no, no, I can't see them. Yeah, uh, now it's now it's better. Now it's better. Oh, okay. Maybe I need to be closer to the computer. Yes. This is better. Yes, yes, this is better. So I will not read really this This is my computer. Okay, so Professor Rodekamp, uh, he is now working in the University of New South Wales, Sydney, a senior where he is a professor. And the third one is Professor Xie Tian, where he is also a IT fellow, where yeah, he is now working as a professor in South China University of Technology. So uh, let's welcome our yeah, let's uh, applaud. Uh, as to the motivation of CMI, we have to introduce my undergoing a CMI program and also reveal the very strong factor in the it's not boring. We hope to also promote microwave theory and technical research activity among the young generation. And we try to connect our undergraduate students with distinguished microwave instruction. So today we will give the first DMI and we hope to make uh, all of our attendees to feel good and learn something new from the three distinguished number of lectures. So, uh, this is the DMI program. Yeah, I'd like to thank very much for our DMI working in group effort. Professor Mark, Professor Michael, and also other faculty members in many universities. So, and here is the procedure of the, the today's uh, DMI workshop. Uh, firstly, I would like to invite uh, Professor Maldia Morgan from Pavia University. He will bring us 20 minutes uh, for about the matter of the history. So, Maldia, uh, okay. Uh, Professor Bozzi. Yeah, I'm here. 
I cannot, yeah. I cannot hear Cherry actually. So, uh, yeah, I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, so um, now uh, let's welcome Professor Bozzi to um, deliver the first uh, DMI uh, talk today. Um, uh, it will be around 20 minutes and uh, let's welcome Professor Bozzi. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen in uh, presentation mode? Yes, we can. Okay. So good uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, uh, Professor Cherry Chair, Professor uh, Yang Yang, Professor Shung Gong, uh, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and present this uh, uh, this talk in front of uh, uh, so many motivated students. And uh, uh, my idea for uh, for this uh, uh, presentation was. Uh, to give an overview of the development of uh, RF and microwave technology from, uh, let's say, what was uh, 30, 40 years ago to what is now and uh, what is going to be in the next years. So I have organized my presentation in uh, uh, two major parts. The first one is a kind of description of the evolution and uh, future vision of RF and communication technology in our everyday life. And the second part is uh, more about the technological requirements. What do we need to do to be able to implement uh, all these uh, future applications? And there are some uh, items that I will, I will develop. So let's start from, uh, from the past. If uh, we think of the technology that was uh, in everyday life uh, 40 years ago, so long before uh, uh, the birthday of, uh, many, of, uh, of, you, uh, of uh, many of the students here, well, we can say that uh, there were three major areas where RF and communication technology was important. One was the, the phone. It was a, a landline, no mobile phone at the time. And then there was the radio and the TV. And in the first case, in the case of the, of the phone, the signal was coming through a cable. So it was a connected uh, uh, device. For the radio, there was uh, an antenna integrated uh, with the device that received the signal. And in the case of the TV, there was uh, the antenna on the roof. That was the scenario of uh, RF and micro technology 40 years ago. But if we think at uh, recent years, uh, we had some uh, major applications that uh, enter in our everyday life. And one was uh, for sure the mobile phone. So if you think at the mo evolution of mobile phones, we had uh, very large devices uh, in, uh, in the 90s that became uh, progressively smaller and smaller. And uh, this was one of the smallest that uh, uh, was available. So we tried to, to miniaturize uh, the uh, size uh, of, uh, of mobile phones. But then suddenly the size started to increase again, mainly because we wanted to put more functions uh, inside the mobile phone. So until this point, it was just for making phone calls and then progressively it became kind of a small computer. All this was possible because of integration. So the keyword that we need to keep in mind uh, that permitted to shrink the size of mobile phones and then to add uh, more and more functions was uh, the capability to integrate uh, a lot of devices, a lot of functions in a small space. Of course, when we think at mobile phones, we need also to think at the network infrastructure. <clears throat> the mobile phones communicate one to each other through an antenna that is on a base station that is connected to a central, uh, let's say, uh, phone switch or center that uh, makes the routing and then can send our mobile call either to a fixed phone or to another mobile phone. So the network infrastructure is also a complex structure that permitted uh, to have uh, uh, this uh, mobile phone network uh, available to all of us. And network is another big advance in the last uh, uh, recent years. So if you think at the Wi-Fi networks, they permit to connect uh, a lot of devices all together and to the internet. And uh, to be able to connect all these devices with a complex uh, system, that uh, is able to manage signals with different frequencies in the same space 
to connect each individual device that can be a laptop, a mobile phone, a printer, a external hard disk, whatever, between them and uh, to the internet. And the internet, of course, has the function to, uh, to connect uh, all computers together, and uh, we will see uh, in the future much more. And of course, this is possible only if you have a broadband available, a, a stable connection, so on. So all the network infrastructure is also very important and completely relies on modern tools of, uh, based on uh, uh, RF and communication technology. What else? Well, another important device that sometimes we underestimate is the GPS, is the Global Positioning System. This is important, of course, if you are traveling uh, in a place that you don't know because it tells you the, the way to follow, but also it is important for uh, uh, driving airplanes, for defense systems, for many more, for many more uh, uh, applications. And in this case, uh, the network uh, is, a, is even more complex because it relies uh, on a, a set of, uh, of satellites. So the GPS, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the operation uh, principle of GPS. You receive signals from different satellites and uh, you know the position of the satellite and the time when they send the signal. And so by triangularization, you define your point uh, on the surface of the Earth. So somehow in this case, the network infrastructure that is uh, an RF system is even, more, is even more complex. And then there are a number of other uh, applications where microwaves are important. Of course, the microwave oven for cooking food. And in this case, uh, there is a signal at uh, 2.45 uh, uh, gigahertz that uh, warms the water inside your food and permits your food to cook, basically. Uh, there are sensors for security, the alarm system of uh, houses or many uh, buildings. There is satellite TV. There are many more applications where micro and RF uh, are, are important. But what's coming next? Well, if we think at, uh, at the future, what we can expect uh, is that, uh, first of all, wearable device, devices uh, will become more and more important. Nowadays, we already have the band watches, for instance, that permit to have uh, to monitor some functions uh, some physical functions like uh, the number of steps we make or the earth beat, uh, and they progressively integrate more and more functions, as you can see, for instance, in the number of apps that are available in this, uh, in this watch. But uh, this uh, concept of wearable devices will probably become more and more uh, uh, important in the future. For instance, by integrating uh, some devices directly in the cloth. And here there is an example of a project we made uh, uh, a few years ago, together with the University of Ghent in Belgium. And the idea here was uh, to be able to develop localization systems in the jacket of firefighters. The problem was uh, to be able to localize a firefighter inside the building, where you cannot use GPS because indoor it doesn't work uh, uh, properly. So the idea was uh, to integrate uh, uh, localization systems uh, directly in the material of the jackets in order to avoid any extra weight and any problem of movement to the firefighters. So in this case, we realized the antennas and a complete system by using the material of the jacket of the firefighters so that the device is completely, is fully integrated in, in the clothes. And this concept is uh, uh, relies, of course, uh, on another keyword that we need to keep in mind, which is materials. Uh, in the past uh, 40, 50 years, uh, migrant people has been used to work with uh, basically two materials, metal and plastic materials. But for the future applications, we need to consider many more materials that are specific for uh, the application where we want to uh, integrate uh, our, our devices. So for instance, uh, uh, for wearable devices, we need to consider cloth as the material, uh, so textile for, as the material for, for our applications. And this will become uh, uh, more and more important, for instance, for biomedical applications. 
if you think uh, uh, there are more and more devices that measure, measure your temperature, measure your earth beat, uh, and for instance, your ECG and so on, but think uh, the possibility to have uh, all these uh, devices, uh, all these sensors uh, integrated uh, in a T-shirt. You wear your T-shirt and you are able to monitor a lot of different functions, ECG, EEG, uh, movement, uh, uh, and, and many more many more activities. And for instance, uh, for elder people, even the risk uh, to fall. So if they can detect the falling in, uh, uh, in elder people. And in the case there is any problem, the system can send uh, via Bluetooth or uh, NFC, can send the signal to your uh, mobile phone, and from your mobile phone, the information goes to your doctor so that you receive a diagnosis and possibly the medicines or the care you need. So this is uh, a future scenario that uh, is probably very close in time. Of course, uh, what do we need uh, to be able to implement this? We need sensors. We need a large variety of sensors that are able to measure all these quantities. Of course, temperature and earth beat, and this is already available, but many more functions that can be uh, easily integrated in uh, the cloth and of course they can easily integrate your cloth at a low cost and with easy fabrication that is always uh, the important point uh, if you want to have uh, applications with uh, a uh, widespread uh, uh, diffusion another uh, big area is uh, related to all those applications that fall under the umbrella of the Internet of Things. The idea of the Internet of Things is uh, to connect uh, uh, billions of uh, inanimated objects uh, through the Internet. Uh, these inanimated objects are somehow, again, sensors that permit to improve our quality of life in different areas, including, of course, information technology, but also security, monitoring of industrial processes, uh, all applications applications related to healthcare and biomedical systems, and then smart homes, smart grids, uh, and so on. And uh, the problem of having a billion of uh, sensors distributed uh, uh, around is also related to another issue, that is uh, the one of power management. How do we feed uh, all these sensors? If we, have, uh, if we create uh, uh, several billion sensors distributed everywhere, we cannot think uh, to go there every six months or one year to change the battery. There is no way. It is not uh, uh, sustainable from an economic point of view, from an environmental point of view. So this is uh, not a solution. If we want to do that, we need uh, autonomous sensors. So sensors that uh, are able to get uh, the power they need uh, by themselves. For instance, by collecting the RF energy that is available in the environment. We are used to this concept, for instance, with uh, uh, solar panels. They collect uh, solar energy and transport to power they can use. We can do that also with uh, RF uh, energy. So these sensors can collect the energy, rectify the signal, store in separate capacitors, and use then this energy for their operation. So the other big uh, keyword that uh, we need to consider is uh, the energy management. So this is another another important point that we need to keep in mind for the generation for the future generation of uh, RF uh, and communication systems. The last application I want to discuss uh, is the autonomous driving. The uh, next generation of cars that drive completely by themselves uh, is uh, very close uh, in the future. So we have. Uh, most of the technology available, we still need some regulations, but uh, probably uh, in uh, maybe 10, 15 years, uh, we will stop driving our cars uh, and uh, uh, we will have uh, hopefully a safer uh, traffic in the street. But what do we need for that? Well, we need uh, basically all the keywords we discussed before. We need integration, we need sensors, we need materials, we need networks, we need power management and uh, a lot of uh, other uh, related uh, related topics. So this is uh, the, the future scenario and uh, uh, that's probably 
a topic uh, you will work on or many of you work will work on when we you will enter the uh, profession of engineers but uh, we have listed a number of uh, of keywords in a uh, uh, in the in the previous part but uh, let's try to understand uh, which are more in detail the technological requirements uh, that uh, are needed to be able to implement uh, all these applications. Well, we started to talk about integration. What is integration? It's the capability to integrate active elements like transistors and uh, amplifiers and so on, the passive components like uh, uh, transmission lines, filters, and so on, and the antennas in one single uh, device, in one single system, and possibly at low cost. So we really need uh, a, an efficient integration technology, efficient in terms of performance, in terms of uh, uh, design complexity, and uh, in terms uh, of cost. Here you see a, a radar sensor at 94 gigahertz, and you see what can be done. This works perfectly. But uh, you see here there is a portion uh, that is a, ba a baseband circuit. There is uh, the frequency multiplier, the power amplifier, there are two antennas, and everything, everything is done uh, with different technologies and then uh, mounted uh, on the same board. I say this works perfectly, but this is probably not uh, the right solution if we want to have uh, a low cost and easy to integrate system. A solution like this one, where you integrate uh, antennas, uh, passive components like power dividers and so on, and active components like mixers. Here you can mount the transistors and so on. Everything on the same board with one single fabrication technology is probably a much better concept for future integration. This uh, uh, structure was uh, presented by uh, by the group of a Chinese professor who lives in the US, in, the, in, the, in Canada now, Professor Ki Wu in Montreal. And uh, this is based on the so-called Substrate Integrated Waveguide SIW technology. It is probably a good way, a good uh, uh, criterion for uh, integrating uh, the future generation of uh, uh, wireless systems. The second keyword we need to keep in mind uh, is related to materials. We are used to, to adopt uh, a very limited number of materials for our applications. Well, in the future, for wearable applications, for many more applications, we needed to consider the possibility of using unconventional materials that are suitable for each specific application. And this can include textile for wearable devices, paper for applications, uh, for instance, that are, uh, how to say, uh, careful in terms of uh, environmental impact, and also 3D printing uh, whenever you need uh, a uh, complex flexi flexibility in the design. So here you see some examples. This is an antenna integrated on textile. Here, as uh, you have seen before, we used uh, as the basic material for the antenna, the infill of the jacket of the firefighter. So we adapted our fabrication technique to the specific application. Here, you see a circuit uh, printed uh, on paper. Uh, this was proposed by the group of Professor Manos Tenseris uh, at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, US. And somehow, and basically it was uh, implemented by using an inkjet printer, where instead of, instead of the classical ink, uh, a particular liquid with some uh, silver particles was adopted. So you print uh, on a sheet of paper, but what you obtain is not the normal printer, but it is a circuit with a metallization realized on the paper substrate. And this is a sensor that we uh, recently developed in conjunction with uh, uh, Professor Dominique Schroers uh, at the uh, University of Leuven in, uh, in Belgium. And it is a sensor for liquids that is based on uh, 3D printing. So we 3D printed this structure. You see here this uh, small pipe where the liquid can uh, uh, be inserted. And by measuring the 
uh, electrical characteristics of this structure, we can uh, detect uh, the electrical characteristics uh, of the liquid in terms of permittivity and losses. The third keyword is uh, related to sensors. So sensors are becoming more, more and more important for a variety of applications. What we need uh, is uh, to develop compact structure and low cost that are able to detect uh, and to characterize uh, a variety of liquids and gases. What we need is uh, good performance and low cost. And for this, uh, for instance, the use of uh, planar structures and possibly 3D printed structures can be the winning key because you have complete flexibility in the design, low fabrication cost, fast implementation time. And so this could be, could be a good solution. So additive manufacturing and 3D printing could be an important uh, asset uh, for the next generation of, uh, of these structures. And finally, energy management. We need to have uh, power autonomous sensors that can operate without battery, simply because the replacement is not an option when you have uh, billions of sensors distributed everywhere. So we need the so-called RF energy harvesting systems. And this is an example that was developed by the group of Professor Tenseris, again at Georgia Tech. And uh, the concept is very simple because you have an antenna that collects uh, a signal, for instance, uh, from uh, mobile phone networks or from TV broadcasting or an intentional signal that you transmit. And uh, this signal is then rectified by a solution that is based on diodes somehow and uh, a voltage regulator that brings this to a DC signal that can be either stored in a supercapacitor or directly used, as in this case, for feeding a sensor of ammonia. So you see that in this case, you have no battery here. You collect the energy you need by using an antenna that receives the signal available in the environment. So somehow, these are the technological requirements that we need to keep in mind to be able to, for the next generation of uh, uh, wireless systems. In conclusion, I want to give you a final message. If you think back uh, at what I presented to you, we can say that uh, to be able to contribute uh, to the technological evolution of uh, RF and communication systems in the future, we need to be able to combine uh, multiple skills. And these include uh, micro and antenna engineers, experts in microelectronics, material scientists, ener energy specialists, and much more. So the final sentence is, uh, the progress comes from the collaboration of experts in different disciplines. So this is especially important for students. Uh, don't consider the topics you like less uh, as unimportant. You need to have a good view of uh, the entire scenario, and then you focus on the topic you like, but when you are able to understand uh, all, all, the other, all the other topics. So this completes my presentation, and. Uh, Later, I will be happy to answer any, yeah. any question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, oh. you. thank you very much, Professor Bozzi, for the uh, wonderful talk. And uh, we learn a lot from your presentation. Thank you once again. Um, so uh, so, uh, so uh, if uh, any of the uh, students sitting here or have any question, please uh, um, well, we have the uh, question and answer uh, session at the end of the workshop. So um, please suggest that you can keep the notes with your question. We can ask you um, after the um, um, after the presentations by Professor Xue Chen and Professor uh, Rodika Roma. Okay, thank you so much. Let's let's welcome Professor um, Rodika Roma for the presentation. Uh, so while we are waiting, so might just uh, kindly remind the the uh, moderators in each um, classroom that uh, prepare, please prepare to collect the questions from the from your students, right? So once we finish the presentation uh, after um, after Professor Xie uh, Chuan's presentation, and we can uh, start ask questions. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Let's welcome Professor uh, Radhika Roma. Uh, 
uh, Professor. Yep, I think. Uh, yep, it's good. Yep. You hear me? Yeah, I can hear now. So, uh, sorry, you were uh, you were muted. So now it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rodika Raymer, and I'm a professor in the School of Electrical Engineer. Sorry, there is a lot of echo on my side. So I'm a professor in School of Electrical Engineering and uh, Telecommunications at the University of New South Wales, and I represent the Microwave and Millimeter Wave Laboratory. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, and thank you for the organizing committee uh, to bring is bringing us all together to this session, and in particular to Professor so, Wen Kuan uh, Che more? and uh, Dr. Um, Yang Yang. So today we will have... take 20 minutes or so to have a brief look uh, into one of the many microwave technologies, the um, enabling uh, technology. Uh, of RF MEMS. Uh, professor, present, uh, sorry, Professor Rodika Rama, uh, I think uh, um, maybe if you can turn on the mic uh, volume a little bit uh, higher, because uh, um, maybe uh, some of the audience they can't hear um, very clearly. Uh, um, yeah, I have maximum. Okay, now it's better. Yeah. But I just have um, a lot of echo at my side. Oh, um, I think it's okay uh, now. I think maybe, I think for the individual uh, part participants, you can increase your volume on your side. Yeah. If you, you know, I think I, I can hear uh, Professor Raymond very clearly. Yeah. Okay. So, um, um, we will uh, present critical achievements of this technology and uh, point out at uh, what uh, is this technology known for and applications. And we will present a few RF MEMS components representative for the evolution of this technology. On this slide here, we show the outline of the talk where we start uh, answering to the questions, what are the MEMS? And then we will be looking at RF MEMS technology as enabling circuits reconfigurability. Then we will be looking at potential applications and RF MEMS switches as critical components and examples, RF MEMS multiple switches and ma matrices and examples. And then we will be looking at 2D and 3D filters, examples and concept, and finally, at the antennas and phase shifter examples. So, um, if we are asked to answer the question, what are the MEMS? We know MEMS is the acronym of microelectromechanical systems that are electrical and mechanical devices fabricated using integrated circuit technology. MEMS have been developed in the 1970s and 1980s primarily for sensors, uh, sensor application, optical technologies such as MOEMs, and um, experimentation in biology and biochemistry, and we call them biomems. These devices have been uh, developed by mechanical engineers. In the um, 1990s and uh, later, the RF MEMS uh, radio frequency microelectromechanical technologies emerge um, in the community with the um, uh, aim to improve the microwave tunable passive uh, devices, such as phase shifter, resonators, filters, antennas, and others. So, um, RF MEMS technology emerge as an enabling technologies and evolved economically competitive enough to enter the marketplace. RF MEMS represents a technology that allows the use of two dimensional and integrated circuit techniques for the fabrication of three dimensional radio frequency and microwave components, devices, subsystems such as inductors, capacitors, switches, filters, phase shifters, antenna, 
so routing and redundant networks. The critical elements of these technologies are the switches. They are the enablers of reconfigurability. And reconfigurability is achieved by a physical modification of the electrical length of the 2D transmission line or a simple switched access to a variety of circuits or a 3D structure by a physical modification of the electromagnetic field. Reconfigurability and the potential of integration with passive platform provided benefits for the development of new circuits and systems architectures and more embedded functions in the same circuit. If we look at the applications of uh, <clears throat> RFMEMS technology, they are in the transmitter and receiver reconfigurable end uh, of satellite systems, base station, mobile handsets and other communication related applications. They are primarily used for uh, filtering functions, impedance matching, uh, band and mode um, function switching, and also for the antenna beam steering by phase array uh, methods. Switches uh, are the most representative of the RF MEMS components, and they have ideal properties in terms of uh, small size, lightweight, very good RF performance in terms of uh, iso isolation, linearity and insertion loss, very low DC power consumption, low loss reconfigurability. RF MEMS switches combine the advantages of both mechanical and semiconductor switches, exhibiting superior performance compared to the conventional mechanical and semiconductor pin diets and the gallium arsenide base effect switches. On this uh, uh, slide here, we have a table where we compare the RF MEM switches with other semiconductor technologies. If we look at, at the insertion loss, we see that it's comparable with all the other technologies. However, in terms of linearity, um, the RF MEM switches are as good as the silicon on sapphire switches and very close to the gallium arsenide pseudomorphic high electron mobility transistors, which have a 72 maximum linearity, 72 dBm. In terms of isolation, the RF MEM switches um, have the highest isolation. And um, if we look at, uh, at the actuation voltage, the actuation voltage is the highest among all the technologies. Switching time, however, is the slowest is a, of all the technologies. If we um, try to classify um, MEM switches, there are various ways that we classify based on their attributes and characteristics. So in terms of um, attributes, um, we need to look at the actuation mechanism, the movement of the mechanical part at the contact tip type, circuit configuration, beam time and beam location. In, in terms of uh, characteristics, the electrostatic um, actuation is the um, most common actuation and it's uh, the fastest um, of all uh, the other technologies. In terms of movement of the mechanical part, we have vertical and lateral movement. The contact type can be metal to metal or metal insulator metal and the circuit configuration from the electrical uh, point of view can be can uh, as in series or shunt uh, connection. In terms of beams, we have a cantilever beam and fixed fixed beams. And in terms of uh, beam location, we have inline and broadside. On this um, uh, slide here, we show the um, picture of um, an inline cantilever beam where we can see that uh, this uh, beam is fixed at one end and uh, uh, performs a movement. Uh, a vertical movement at the other end. If we look at the right hand side uh, drawing, we can see that this cantilever can uh, 
uh, allow the signal to pass from one port to the other one or interrupt it. So this is called single port, single throw configuration. If we have more transmission lines here, then we can design a single pole and throw um, switch where n is the number of the transmission line. For the fixed fixed cantilever beam, we have um, the membrane fixed at both ends and the movement is inside here in the middle uh, of the beam. And this uh, membrane will allow again the signal to pass from one end to another one or um, shunt to the ground the signal, input signal. On uh, this slide here, we show uh, numerous uh, of the electrostatically actuated RF MEM switches that have been uh, developed um, in um, late 90s and uh, afterwards. And um, um, we have uh, ser the series switch in the first row and the shunt switches in the second row. And all these designs here are historical. Uh, I lost connection. Uh, yes, um, looks like uh, you lost the connection there, and uh, we are seeing. We're we are not seeing. Okay. 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 It okay. went back. I don't know what yep. happened. <laughs> no so, problem. Yeah. yeah so, no, you're back. Yeah. So all these um, series, as I said, are are um, historical switches. The um, all the researchers in the world uh, read all these papers and got inspired for their own uh, designs, and they look at various architecture, geometries, various types of materials, um, and so on and so forth. So all these names are very well known and um, are interesting to read um, in uh, your spare time. And on this slide here, we show some other examples from other universities um, where designs that uh, use um, thermal actuation mag magnetic or piezoelectric have been implemented. So these ones, rather than using the electric field that will use the Joule effect or the magnetic field or the piezoelectric effect or piezoelectric materials. Now we start showing you some examples that we produce in our laboratory. They are all designed by our former graduates. And um, as you can see, we have here cantilever beam, which is single pole, single throw um, uh, switch. Uh, we have a camp, clamp, clamp, or fix, fix uh, beam, and another more um, interesting uh, different uh, type of um, uh, cantilever beam. All these uh, switches have uh, good uh, insertion loss, return loss, isolation, and actuation voltage, as we can see in the um, graphs uh, on the second row. Now we can move to the next group of devices, the multiport sw switches and switch matrices, so um, which um, have applicability in the uh, architecture of um, applications. Um, for signal routing, redundant network, and beam linking networks. In this um, figure to the left, we show a redundant ring made of T port switches and amplifiers and a spare amplifier S1, which show that in the case of a faulty amplifier, the input signal can bypass the faulty um, path and um, uh, go through the spare amplifier and deliver the signal at the output. On this right hand side, we show a very popular, again, very classic um, picture of a switch matrix uh, application in a beam link system. We have here six um, locations uh, in the world which send signals to the system. And uh, these uplinks are converted into some channels by the systems, and uh, they will be converted uh, into signals delivered through the um, downlink to the uh, requ required spots. And examples of uh, multiple switches here we have a single pole three stroke. So, as you can see, the signal 
it from the input uh, goes this way and then is uh, shared with the other three signal lines or four lines as uh, here. Um, many other structures uh, such as um, uh, using more complex switches, four port switches have been tried, so such as R type, C type and T type with good performance. And uh, on the next slide, we show only one of them the implementation of the crossbar type, so a four port switch where the signal pass um, follows a turn or a true uh, state as it's called. And um, we can see this implementation of these two function in this fabricated device. So the signal goes from port one and goes to port four to, four, to perform the turns turn state or it goes from port one to port two and port three to port four for the through state. This was used as a, a unit cell to uh, create switch matrices. So here we have an example by three by three switch matrix, which uh, has this response here. And uh, this is a scalable structure where additional um, switches, uh, switch matrix, Sorry, additional columns and rows can be added to increase the size of the switch. If we move now to the next um, important devices for these technologies, they are the reconfigurable filters. Uh, they have applications for the front end architecture for the selection of the relevant band and standard function. And um, both 2D and 3D waveguide options have been explored and they offer reduced costs for the transceiver due to more function implementation in the same hardware. On this uh, um, cartoon here, we can see that um, we can uh, move from one frequency response to another one using two or more uh, filters, a filter bank. However, we can achieve the functions of um, this uh, option A by um, uh, using the same structure and um, allowing the same filter structure to uh, switch between different bands. And also we can uh, uh, assign more functions, more complex functions to the filter to uh, have a tunable and more compact structures. And we'll show this later. So we, here we have an example of a structure that have been uh, developed. So this is the fabricated X-band three-pole band pass filter in CPW technologies, where three reconfigurable states have been achieved. Um, and uh, as you can see here, the response can move within the frequency bands within the um, X-band, and um, the feature is th uh, is that the b uh, band with um, was kept at constant, uh, ab, ab, constant. At, so we had absolute bandwidth, constant absolute bandwidth. On this slide here, we show other examples. Um, so we have two millimeter away reconfigurable bandpass filters, both of them in coplanar waveguide technologies that can operate uh, in two bands, 60 gigahertz and E band with good isolations. So here we can see a switchable bandpass filter, which um, can uh, produce operation for these two frequency band by using a, a single pole double throw switch with back to back switches. And um, on the right hand side, we show a very compact bandpass filter where all the components of the filter, the resonators, the um, inverters and others have been uh, um, made uh, reconfigurable. And as you can see, this compact structure could have been obtained and the sign was reduced from um, this size to 4.75 times 3.75 millimeters square. However, if we look at the uh, insertion loss for a planar structure is quite uh, uh, high, which is actually expectable at uh, those frequencies. So our the 3D filter um, were also um, tried and uh, uh, where waveguides with uh, special uh, 
special uh, developed circuits inserted in certain location in the waveguide could use to implement uh, various functions. And on this right hand side, we show how using these structures work as band stop and certain uh, desired frequency can be allowed. This uh, uh, proposed uh, technology enables uh, the operation uh, to very high frequency, um, for example, 220 to 325 gigahertz and even higher. So this technology is proposed to replace the traditional technologies where, as you can see, we have multiple waveguide systems uh, marked also here and also very bulky uh, switches. And here we have an implementation of um, one of those uh, aims. So we have um, uh, 3D uh, printer, which sorry, 3D filter <laughs> and um, um, this um, has a central frequency at 24 gigahertz and by properly operating these uh, elements inside the waveguide, uh, we can uh, allow the filters to have the on and off function. Now we move to other devices which had the uh, impact from the RF MEMS technology, the antennas and the phase shifters. And um, here we have an example of the quasi Yagi antenna, which operates at 60 and uh, gigahertz and the E band. And uh, here we achieve this operation by uh, uh, by adding these uh, switches, which modify the electrical uh, length of uh, the directors. On uh, this um, slide here, we have uh, much uh, lower frequencies. Um, a, a spiral antenna which operates at 3.3 gigahertz and uh, various switches were inserted and operated on and off um, following a, a certain pattern and um, to achieve certain um, radiation patterns. On this, slide, on this drawing here, we show a 3D radiation pattern, including uh, all the cases in a single plot. Another um, device that has been tried is the E-band um, uh, phase shifter. And um, um, as you can see here, we achieved uh, a very small design. This is on quartz, 2.684 micrometer and 704 micrometer. And um, we achieved um, a good insertion loss, high return loss and small um, phase uh, error. Phase shifters are very important, as you can see in this figure here. They uh, uh, the, they produce the proper desired signal, uh, which feeds the antenna for uh, beam forming. So um, yeah, uh, perfect. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Too long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. 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 Just uh, um. Yeah. Just keep going. Yeah. So uh, allowing. So this RF MEMS technology uh, uh, emerges an enabled technology and for reconfigurable circuits of, of the transceiver front end for wireless communications. It uh, allows um, the op operational uh, de devices operation from hundreds of megahertz to uh, less than 100 gigahertz. And RF MEMS switches exhibit superior performance uh, compared to the conventional mechanical and semiconductor pin diodes and the gallium um, arsenide based uh, switches, but operate below the p hemp and uh, silicon on sapphire switches in terms of speed and actuation um, voltage. So with this, um, uh, thank you for um, your uh, attendance and uh, listening to uh, our presentation in particular to the students uh, and academics who spend their time on Friday afternoon. And also thank you uh, to uh, Professor Che and uh, Dr. Yang uh, and the um, uh, organizing committee of Region 10 Education Committee. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Professor Roma, for the wonderful talk. And uh, yeah, we really appreciate the, that we see a lot of examples um, presented here. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there will be some questions after the um, um, 
presenter, uh, presentation by Professor Xue. So um, please uh, take some rest and uh, we will uh, come to the question session later. All right, so let's welcome uh, Professor Xue Xuan for the third talk today. Okay, thank you, Professor Yang. So now let me share my slide here. So can you see my slide? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let me start. Uh, dear student and dear friends, good afternoon and good evening. Oh, good morning, friends all over the world. Today, I would like to have a very brief introduction to microwave technology. Actually, it is the magic be behind wireless communication and radio. I'm Xue Quan from South China University of Technology. I am from the School of Electronic and Information Engineering. Here, my story begins from the top 10 most beautiful equations in the world. And you can see the most beautiful equations, including Maxwell equations, Euler's identity, Newton's second law of motion, Pythagorean theorem, mass, uh, mass energy equivalence, uh, Schrodinger equations, and the most uh, the simplest uh, equation, basic algebra equation, one plus one equation two. It's, I know it when I was at the age of three. And uh, you can see among the top 10 most beautiful equations, Maxwell equations ranks number one. Why? You can see why is the Maxwell equations is so important and it is so beautiful and the ranks number one. Because Maxwell is very important. You can see here Maxwell equation representing the coupling relationship between electrical field and magnetic field. It is the foundation of classical electromagnetism, classical optics, and electrical circuit it is it can be used for analyzing and describing the behavior of electromagnetic waves the chart here shows the spectrum of electromagnetic wave which range from extremely low frequency to gamma rays and the frequency uh, can be a couple of hertz to 30 e hertz and the wavelengths range from 6000 kilometer to 1 nanometer or even 10 picometer so this is the electromagnetism spectrum but among them the microwave spectrum is one of the most useful frequency bands at lower bands of microwave we call it RF or radio frequency. At higher band of the microwave, we call millimeter wave or and terahertz. So here we show the most popular applications of microwave, which are wireless communications and radar. For wireless communication. It is used for information transmission through electromagnetic waves. There are two parts generally. The first part is transmitter, which is used for modulating the information to EM waves and then transmitting them out. At the receiver side, it is used to is used for receiving the modulated EM waves and then demodulating them into the transmitted information. So this is uh, the way how wireless communication work. And for radar, actually it's uh, represent for radio detection and uh, ranging. 
It is used for location and the speed detection through microwave. For the di di direction, the direction of the radar beam can be used for decide the detection the di direction of the object. And for distance, it's calculated through the speed of EM wave and the time between the transmitted electromagnetic wave and the received. For speed, it calculated by the Doppler effect of microwave. So this is how microwave can enhance can enable the function of radar. Here shows the microwave evolution. You can see that in in 1850, Maxwell's equation predict that the existence of electromagnetic waves and from then on we can make use of we can see that we can use make use of it was from another way to transmit signals and receive signals so in in the nine nineteen nine uh, or nineteen something year the first the trans oceanic radium communication is established was established and uh, the first practical reader was uh, invented at that time. In 1960s, the microwave communication, satellite communication, and phased array radar um, come to use. In 1990s, mobile communication become more and more popular. And the mobile communication um, developed from the first generation to the second generation, third generation, and fourth generation. Now, now we are enjoying the fifth generation of mobile communication. Um, and now we also enjoy many wireless communication devices such as wearable device, automotive radar, parallel security, something like that. So microwave is more and more popular in our daily life. Here is just a very brief and the typical wireless system. There are three parts of them. The first part is microwave antenna. The second part, uh, microwave ICs, use as trans transceiver, which is transmitter and uh, uh, receiver. And the third part is IF and uh, baseband, which is intermediate frequency and baseband signals. So this is a wireless system. And you can see among three part of the system, two of them are microwave related. So we can see that the antenna and the IC microwave technology enable emerging wireless applications. So I will introduce two parts of the microwave technology. The first is antenna, and the second is integrated circuit of microwave. So first is antenna. So what is antenna? Antenna is a key component of wireless system. It read it or receive electromagnetic waves. It is a port for EM wave going in or going out from the electric circuit. So antenna is an uh, interface, very important interface between circuit and, and the air. And here is shows some type of antenna, including Yagyu ante antenna, parabolic antenna, um, di uh, multiple antenna, dipole antenna, hole antenna, patch antenna, and uh, um, base station antenna, we can see the tower at the tower or the building mounting on the tower and building so these are types of antennas and here we show some state of the art of antennas now we are using the first one is a y coupled wideband distance antenna which can operate from 1.7 gigahertz to 2.8 gigahertz which is a wideband antenna the second one is the dual polarization antenna 
operating from 8 gigahertz to 10 gigahertz. And third one is a filtering dielectric resonance antenna, which combine filter and antenna into one. Okay, it's, and here shows some other state of the art antenna. The first one is metal surface fixed array antenna, array antenna, which was developed in the South China University of South China University of Technology. And the second one is a 5G meter millimeter wave terminal antenna, which was also designed by our group. And the third one is a 5G wideband base station antenna, which operate from 20, 24 to 30 gigahertz. Okay, now let's move to integrated circuit, which is uh, very important in a wireless communication or electronic system. IC actually is an electronic circuit integrated on one small piece of semiconductor chip. It contains billions of transistors in a finger layer size, which is about one centimeter square uh, of a semiconductor chip. And ICs are widely used in different devices or equipment, uh, such as cars, mobile phones, PC, camera, PlayStation, TVs, and anything, any machines or equipment you can you can imagine will contain one or many ICs. So ICs is very important. Here I I show you some uh, the some story or history of the IC. Actually the IC starts from transistors in 1947. Bipolar junction transistor was invented, and this is a Nobel Prize winner invention. And then in 1949, uh, the field effect transistor was invented. After that, the first integrated circuit was invented in, 1940, in 1958. And uh, here it shows the Moore's law, how the integral circuit was developed from uh, pro from 1958, very which contains very small number of transistors. And nowadays, the trans number of transistor per square millimeter, millimeter is is a very large number. Okay, so. Uh, here I will show you a video to show how an IC is made. Actually, actually, IC comes from sand, which is silicon dioxide, and uh, it can change into ingot of silicon, and then we can slide them into wafers. After wafer, we applying photoresist to the wafer and uh, exposure through the patterns of the circuit can be put onto the wafer and then to resistant development. After that, ion implantation to make the active part of the of the wafer, then begin trans transistor forming, etching, and removing the half mask. Then silicon dioxide gate is uh, developed. Then insulator applying a high K dielectric on the before the active laser, and then metal gate and then interconnections of metals will be developed. Polishing is very important because the wafer is not so smooth 
and after that, metal lasers interconnection are developed. After that, the wafer must be tested before slicing. And we can every piece of the slide is packed into uh, IC. So this is how IC uh, developed. And here shows some state of the art ICs for wireless communication. Here uh, ICs we developed in the South China University of, of Technology. The first one is a 5G phased array transceiver. In this transceiver, we have um, four channels of transmitting and receiving. And the second one is 5G gallium nitride mirror wave front end. And the third one is a mirror wave com reader transceiver. Here we can see that IC is in a mobile phone. You can see there are eight. RF ICs and couple of antennas here. So they are all use microwave technology. So we will ask a question why emerging microwave applications, so many emerging microwave applications. The reason I think too, the first is advanced semiconductor process. The second one is advanced antenna and array technology. These two technology leading to microwave system with lower cost and high performance, including antennas and ICs. Here, I will give you some examples of emerging applications. The first one, of course, is most popular mobile communications. Now, we are enjoying 5G mobile, communication, mobile communications and uh, I believe in the near future, we can enjoy the sixth, the generation, sixth generation mobile communications. Here is uh, a comparison between 4G and 5G. And you can see the latency of signal transmission can be reduced from 10 microseconds to less than one microsecond. And the connection density can increase from 100,000 per connection per uh, kilo square meter to 1 million connection per kilo square meters. And the data rate can be, the peak data rate can increase from 1 gigabit per second to 20, giga, 20 gigabit per cent. So this is the evolution, how evolution from 4G to 5G wireless communication. And here, another emerging application is automotive reader. It can be used to speeding, detection, collect, colliding, avoidance, automatic driving, something like that. Here, actually, here is a, here is a video, but because of time constraint, so I will skip it, skip that, and go to the next slide. Here is also another emerging application of reader. Recognition reader, so we can use the gesture to detect, to do readers uh, detect the gesture, gesture gesture of hand. We can also use reader to medical application and indoor location. So in summary, microwave technology can be can be used widely used in emerging wireless applications for radar, uh, 5G, 6G, or many other applications of, such as medical applications, something like that. And ICs and antennas are the most important to microwave techniques. The purpose of this talk is one to encourage fresh men, fresh students in the university to choose microwave and antenna as their future stream of such studies so that you can enter the wireless communication reader 
and so many other applications of microwave. So this is the purpose of the of my uh, my talk. Thank you, thank you very much for for the edcom the for the for the education community of MTT edcom to invite me as the DMI to give a talk here. And thank you for Professor Che and Professor Yang for for your invite for your uh, moderation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Xu, for the uh, um, very um, exciting talk about the um, the history of the microwave technique and uh, the potential and the today's technology using microwave and the future of microwave technology. Um, so, Professor Chu, do you uh, do you want to? Um, yep, Professor Chu, you there? Do you want to um, collect the question from um, from the site yeah. at the source? Yes, Dr. Yang, uh, I would yep. like to invite Dr. Xin Hongshen in South China University. I will invite Dr. Xin Hongshen. Hello. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentations, Professor. Uh, and I could take a couple of questions from the students, but but because we are now behind the schedule, I maybe the question. Um, so for. Uh, a student asked uh, how can how to um, implement energy management for the variable electronics uh, professor Bozzi, could you give us some ideas I think uh, Professor Hello? Bozzi is uh, muted. Let's uh, let me just uh, turn on his uh, mic. Professor uh, Bozzi. Thank you. Now it's fine. Yep. Uh, so th that's a, that's a good question. I can uh, I can share again the screen and uh, I go to the, the slide. Just a second. Can you see my slide? Uh, yes, we can see, see your slides. Okay. So um, implementing energy uh, management systems is, uh, is not difficult in principle. The difficult thing is getting high energy. So uh, to implement these uh, uh, systems, you need uh, an antenna that can be even a small antenna. That is uh, designed to receive a signal in a frequency band where you know that there is enough, uh, let's, let's call it environmental energy. So uh, some radiation for uh, any broadcasting system. It can be uh, TV broadcasting, it can be uh, 3G, 4G. Uh, and uh, in those frequency bands, you know that there is uh, enough energy that you can collect. So instead of collecting the energy for uh, Taking out a signal, as you typically do for, for instance, for mobile communication, you collect the ener RF energy because you want to extract uh, the information from the signal. In this case, you want to extract uh, energy. So what you do is not sending this uh, uh, signal to a mixer, but you send this signal to a rectifier. That is typically a bridge of diodes, or let's say something a bit more complex, but in principle, it's something that re rectifies uh, your signal, then stabilizes uh, uh, the voltage, and then it sends this uh, DC current to a, a supercapacitor that can store the energy. So this is uh, the the basic idea for for these uh, structures. Uh, I, as I said before, the difficult thing is not uh, uh, implementing the system, but collecting uh, enough energy. So uh, typically, the the power you can get from uh, from this uh, RF energy is quite limited. 
uh, what uh, you can do to actually use these systems in practical applications uh, are two things. The first one is developing systems that require less energy. And the second point is uh, uh, implementing systems with uh, a low duty cycle. So imagine that you have a, a sensor for temperature. You don't need to measure temperature every second or every millisecond. It's enough for many applications if you measure the temperature every half a minute. Okay, because you do not suppose to, uh, you suppose this temperature not to change too quickly. So for uh, half a minute, you collect uh, the RF power and you store more and more energy. And then after 30 seconds, you have, en you have enough energy to activate your system. So for a certain time, you collect the energy and then uh, you, you use it. So the system is simple. The two things to keep in mind is uh, implementing systems that require low energy and implementing systems that uh, have a low duty cycle. These are somehow the, the rules. I don't know if I answer to your question. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, okay, that's the question. okay um, thank you very much for the uh, question uh, from uh, South China University of Technology. So um, is there any other question from um, the um, university clusters from Taoyuan, Taipei, and the uh, Xinzhou area, uh, the national technology. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I just uh, uh, um, unmuted. Uh, uh, you know the a uh, uh, the N S Y S U. Uh, so is a uh, professor Fu Kang Wang here? Yep. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Could you please? Yeah. Yeah, you know, you could, uh, please answer the question uh, on behalf of the student, please. Okay, yes, we really appreciate the impressive insights and the comments from our speakers. And we have one question. Is it possible to apply microwave technology in metaverse applications such as AR or VR? And uh, maybe Professor or Professor Shui can answer the question with more detailed information. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for your question. The answer to your question is definitely yes. Microwave is uh, actually is a uh, must for AI. Or uh, for for AI for for for, for example, um, if you uh, if you use microwave as a data link, so you can move around. If you don't have microwave, you don't have data link. If you move, so the high data rate, especially very high data rate microwave link, is uh, enable technology for AI applications. I can give you another example uh, for, uh, for Robert. You can see, you, you know, Robert has a, a very powerful computer inside. So if you have a very powerful computer inside, it must be very expensive and it's very power con consuming. So if you have a microwave connection to the cloud, so the com computing or um, the or the calculation or the things can be can be done in the cloud. So your robots do not need any powerful computer, and it can be cheap. It can be very uh, low cost and uh, very low power consumption. So this is another uh, example of how microwave can make connection between the cloud and the and the uh, for example the robot. I'm not sure whether I answered your question or not. Uh, yes, thank you. Maybe you can provide more provide more detailed information or write out something. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you so much. And uh, I just wonder if uh, there's any question from uh, uh, Sun Yasan University, um, Professor Shou Yung Jin. Um, can oh, I can see from the chat window that uh, the university uh, from MUG that asking the question in the chat window. So how can the microwave frequency be stabilized and made more strong? I think this this is a, a, a very interesting question. So any, um, let me, I think uh, uh, Radhi, Professor Radhika Rama is muted. Let me just uh, turn on Professor uh, Rama's mic. So. She has turned on. Oh yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, so I think this is an open question. So maybe uh, Professor Radhika Rama, if you want to answer this one. Um, can't, can't hear that. Um, maybe I can try yeah. to answer this question. Uh, oh, thank you so much. First, for the first question, how to stabilize the signal, the frequency of microwave, we can use phase lock the loop because um, uh, for a free running oscillator of microwave the frequency um, is again uh, shifting from one to another because of the uh, temperature or any other noise but if we use phase lock the loop uh, the frequency of microwave can be stabilized by the phase lock, phase lock loop the secret is that the fist locked loop use a crystal resonator. Crystal resonator is the reference oscillator because for a crystal resonator, it's very stable resonator and makes the reference frequency of the oscillator is very stable. And then if we make this as a reference, the the signal of microwave can be the frequency of microwave can be very stable. This is one. Another the second question is how to make the microwave signal stronger. And uh, this is a uh, uh, good question because we always try to make microwave signal stronger. Um, we use two amplifiers. One is power amplifier for transmitting. And another, we use low noise amplifier for receiving. That's my answers. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Um, so um, I think there's another question from the uh, from the chat window that. Um, mm, yeah. So what will be the from the National Taiwan University? What will be the New applications. Uh, what will the new applications be for the six G uh, communications? So, um, I think uh, this could be a question for probably Professor uh, Bozzi or Professor Chen for the six G. I can try to to answer. Actually, six uh, G is a. Uh, uh, still far away. Five uh, G is coming and. Uh, Already, 5G will create a big, uh, uh, let's say, a change in uh, in our life, because uh, uh, somehow we move. Uh, we have a, a paradigm change from 4G to 5G for basically two reasons. One is that uh, we are going to have a much broader uh, operation bands. So, if you have a broader operation band, uh, you can. Uh, uh, have many more applications. I mean, the immediate uh, uh, effect for the user is that uh, you can download a movie in uh, seconds instead of uh, tens of minutes. But uh, if you think a bit, if you make one step more, is uh, uh, that you can implement many more applications. Like autonomous driving will be one of them. The uh, guidance of drones that are becoming more and more popular uh, for both uh, commercial and uh, defense applications will be available. And 
you, you will be able to connect uh, a lot of sensors and so on, because only because you have a uh, broad operation bands. And this is, let's say, the change of paradigm from the side of the user, from the side of the of the per, of the people who implement the technology. The change will be that uh, to have broader operation bands, you need to go to higher frequencies. So uh, typically for uh, micro applications, what is important is the uh, relative bandwidth. So you say I work at that frequency with that percent bandwidth. For instance, I work at uh, one gigahertz uh, with 10% bands. It means that I have an operation band of uh, 100 megahertz. If I work at 60 gigahertz with 10% band, a relative band, I have uh, a band of uh, six gigahertz. So if you want to have the same percent band, but uh, a broader absolute band, you need to move uh, to higher frequencies. And that's exactly what 5G is, uh, is going to do. It's going to move to millimeter waves uh, to have uh, broader operation bands that can uh, allow implementing uh, new applications. But uh, moving to millimeter waves uh, is uh, really a big change for people who implement the systems because uh, you have uh, additional uh, challenges uh, when you work to higher frequencies, both for the active components and uh, for the passive components. Because, uh, for instance, for the passive components, uh, you have uh, you need to use different fabrication technologies that, that permit to have better accuracies. When you implement a system, typically the accuracy is measured in terms of wavelength. So if you go up in frequency, the wavelength becomes smaller and the accuracy you need becomes uh, smaller uh, because it's related to wavelength. So this will be uh, the big challenge for 5G. For 6G, the idea is to go further higher in frequencies, above 100 gigahertz. And that's uh, somehow an unexplored uh, territory because uh, traditionally microwave people work uh, up to some tens of gigahertz. Now we can go to 100 gigahertz, maybe 120. And then there are people working in photonics that uh, start to few terahertz. But in the middle between 100 gigahertz and let's say three terahertz, that is an unexplored territory or there are preliminary works in that frequency range. So that's the area where probably uh, 6G and future generation will have to look at. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's the fund that will come uh, probably in the next decade. Thank you so much, Professor Bode, for the um, answer to the um... Uh, to this question. So um, there's uh, there are a couple of questions coming in from the chat window. Uh, yes. So yeah, the, yeah. yes. Hello. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Yep. yeah. I see a question which is I think a quite a, uh, you, you know interesting and important for uh, you know beginning students. So yes, there's a, a question uh, from Sun San uh, University. Is that basically? Uh, let me let me actually scroll to the. Uh, the question here is basically as a beginner. So there's a there's just a, so many. Uh, let me let me. Uh, as a beginner, it is difficult to understand some concepts and the formulas, right? Could you please give us any suggestion how to start with? I particularly, you know, Professor, uh, I, you know, any of the DMIs can address a question, and uh, you know that you know uh, Professor Xu uh, Chen, you know, showed the uh, you know ten most important equations, right? So now. Uh, Maxwell equations actually they're not easy. You know they're differential equations, and solving those are extremely difficult. And uh, you know all the three DMIs are you know excellent researchers in the field, but uh, I'm pretty sure that you know it's actually not easy to start with. You know for the young generation, you know a lot of the hundreds of students are who are actually you know attending this meeting. So any any of you would like to address this? You know give us uh, you know give give the new uh, young students uh, some some encouragement. Professor Raymar, you, you would like to uh, s start with? I think uh, somehow um, her- She's muted. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Professor uh, Raymar, I think you can, yeah, I think it's, it's good now. I'm muted now. I can- Professor Raymar. Yeah. 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 Can't hear. Yeah, maybe it's called a double double mute. There's a part, you know, sometimes they, you have to kind of like mute yourself again. You know, it's like a double mute in the WebEx. 
try to see if you can double mute. Double muted. Can you hear me? Yeah, now it's good. Yes. I Go don't ahead. know what happens. Uh, okay, so my advice um, is that um, you should have patience. We know that our students prefer to use the zeros and ones. They prefer the digital rather than uh, the divergence uh, gradient and the other operators, but they should not feel uh, scared of those. They should get uh, slowly through all the electromagnetics. And once you have some electromagnetics background, the wall for high frequency is open for you. And there is, uh, so just have the patience. As you'll reach that knowledge that is needed for microwave engineering. And um, um, so just reach that stage. And once you love this part, it's, uh, it's forever. Once uh, you become a member of IEEE, for MTT society and live that it's it's like a disease for the rest of your life. And I tell you, there is an enormous interest in the microwave technology. There will never be a shortage of challenging problems in RF and microwave engineering. There is a need for microwave engineers having both the understanding of fundamentals of microwave engineering as well as the creativity to apply this knowledge to problems of practical interest, such as 5G, 6G, and many more to come. And just trust in your strengths. Never give up. Microengineering is very powerful subject. And as we saw from, uh, from both Professor Shu and Professor Maurizio, it's it's huge. It impacts our life in all the aspects. And you'll be very rewarded by this technology if you get into the microwave engineering. I think that's all I can say at the moment. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, so we let's maybe uh, have a look at the questions from uh, the um, uh, from Said there. So it's uh, from Air University. Uh, I think it's from Pakistan, right? So the question is about 6G will be using emerging technologies such as edge and AI uh, in its network nodes that also require high energy. So will 6G have, uh, has to solve the issues of harvesting, charging, and the um, conservation of energy. So it's more about the, the uh, power consumption and the energy in 6G. So I think this, this is an interesting question for everyone. So um, please, uh, if uh, any of the DMIs can answer this one. Maybe I can start. Uh, the issues related to energy harvesting is more related to sensor nodes uh, than to the entire system. So we we are quite far from the possibility to use a harvesting for uh, base stations, for instance. Base stations will be always uh, probably connected to a power source, a strong power source. But if we have uh, uh, small uh, sensors distributed everywhere, in that case, uh, for the sensors, we can use uh, energy harvesting. So uh, the the main network will be always be powered in a normal way, but if we have distributed sensor networks, the individual sensors can uh, uh, in, can uh, benefit from the use of harvesting systems. So it is only for those uh, uh, portions of the network that uh, require to transmit a little information, and they are typically extremely small and compact uh, uh, devices. So that's that's my view for uh, for for the future of energy harvesting. Different story is the wireless power transfer. So a similar uh, approach is the one where you have a system to collect energy, but you intentionally transmit some energy in the direction of the device. So that's something that uh, is already implemented, for instance, in uh, some uh, object of everyday life. For instance, in the tooth electric toothbrush, you have a, 
water power transfer system. So you don't uh, plug uh, the, uh, the brush uh, to the power, but you just uh, locate uh, on a base uh, that uh, permit to transfer the energy or some uh, uh, mobile phones. You have a base and you put your mobile phone there and there is a wireless transmission of power. But that's a different story because uh, wireless power transfer requires intentional transmission of power. Energy harvesting, means that you are collecting some spare energy from the environment. And so the power level that you can get in the two cases is quite different. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor Bozzi, for this uh, answer to the energy in 6G. Uh, so let's have the last question here. I can see there are still many questions in the chat window and uh, I'm, I feel really sorry that we can't maybe address all of those questions because we have like a list today, maybe nearly 1,000 attendees. So maybe we can collect the questions after the workshop and uh, um, maybe we, uh, we just have the last question here. So um, let's uh, have a look here. So um, I think again, uh, there is an interesting question about still about the a 6G, because it sounds like a lot of interesting about the 6G, about extreme localization in 6G due to the um, limit of millimeter waves. I think this is a very um, um, uh, a question with uh, some uh, um, um, knowledge about millimeter waves uh, and potential application in the future. So maybe um, a Professor was well, the already, already answered? Maybe Professor Xu Chuan or Professor uh, uh, Radhika Roma will uh, answer so the what, last one. What I, what I could say is that yep. millimeter waves, uh, millimeter wave circuits are, are much more difficult to approach, require much more skills for the microwave engineers. They are very delicate, there are parasitics, and uh, very difficult to handle. So if these circuits, I mean, many circuits have been very well known for the satellite applications, and there are many people who know how to handle those quite easily. We still have to learn at the universities and at, mo at lower level how to handle these circuits. Moreover, they are very expensive. The, the fabrications of microwave circuits is extremely expensive. The same, the equipment for using, um, for measuring. So um, I had uh, one uh, circuit that we worked out in our lab for one of our PhD students. And uh, I tell you, it cost us about 80,000 to be able to do the fabrication and measurements. So um, we need training. Uh, and we need to have experience and learn how to use these much higher frequencies. And moreover, we need to have access to fabrication facilities, which are also very expensive. So we'll see how much will penetrate the millimeter wave technology at the university level. Thank you very much. Uh, and actually, we have included many things, but because of the limitations, and we have to close the CMI workshop for uh, closing this event. I would like to have very quick. And firstly, I would like to thank uh, our team, PC, which is my professor. And Professor Christian, uh, thank you very much for your very, very interesting speech. Uh, I believe you have inspired the interest of our undergraduate. And I also believe you know, will um, come to enjoy this field. Continue. Maybe related to the matter of knowledge. Future professional career development field. So, um, this is really a very big, uh, successful event. And I also thank our um, attendees.
from over 15 universities in the UK, from Guangzhou, from Tunisia, from Nanjing, and from Taipei, uh, from Kaohsiung, and from several cities in the UK. Yes. I, I hope uh, this question is well being connected and sent to our TMI users to be answered by the moderators and forward the question is answered. Yes. So uh, this, uh, this is the first time TMI workshop. But it, uh, I think this is a very successful exercise. So, uh, after this uh, first TMI workshop, we will try to organize uh, some other workshops. Maybe this time in the new one to see. And later, maybe in next America. And later, we will come back to the return. So, um, resilience. Uh, I hope you will look forward to another team workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Charlie, yeah, Charlie, I may, may I just make a few quick comments here? Uh, so this is Sean again. Um, uh, actually, I originally I thought that I need to go to sleep, but I'm so excited about the presentation. So I stayed for the entire period. So you know, the three uh, presentations were uh, they are very uh, inspiring, even you know, for me as a you know a microengineer for and a faculty member for a long time. Uh, so, based uh, first of all, is that uh, you know, as suggested by one participant, is that we are going to send the slides to all the registered participants. So we're gonna collect the slides from the three DMIs and are gonna email to all the participants. Secondly, is that this meeting is recorded in as a video. So we are going to post it on the MTT website. So when it's available, we're going to inform everybody. And certainly, as a doc, uh, Professor Chair mentioned, that you know this DMI meeting is not a one-time thing. So we're going to actually continue it on a rolling basis across the, the world. And uh, we uh, we encourage you to participate. Even let's say the next one, the next plan one will be mainly for Region Eight, yeah, Europe, Europe, and uh, and Africa. But you know, if your time, if we, if you are really, if you really like, you can also participate because it's virtual. So that's uh, pretty convenient. And we would definitely love to see the young, young generations to be is excited into the microwave engineering because I believe that it is actually it's not easy, but it is very uh, important. And it also, I think it's a very rewarding as many of the DMIs keep you know talk uh, mentioning about that. So. Certainly, this is a great field to be in and uh, it's excellent, you know, technical field and. Uh, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that you know a lot of us have been enjoying this. You know, I actually saw a couple of other faculty members just uh, you know popped up in the meeting, which they did not say anything. So, yeah. So thank you. Uh, I think that you know uh, I really appreciate all the DMIs and also you know Professor Che, Yang Yang. You know they have been doing a fantastic job to you know and also so many students actually you know they they made their best effort in attending and you know from uh, you know different universities. I'm so excited to see. I think that we probably have. More than 10 universities which can actually make it uh, in person meetings actually you know in person means that in person in their own university so thank everybody yeah you want to say uh, something oh uh, yes i think uh, thank you so much everyone so i think before you uh we go so do we want to have a, a photo together yeah so and um, i don't yeah. like to take a photo. <laughs> yeah well it's hard uh yeah it's hard and uh, let yeah. me just uh Maybe the DMIs turn on the, uh, turn on the cameras and uh, we can have the DMIs to sit together. We can have a photo here. Um, yeah. can you can we... do screen capture. Yeah, you, can, you maybe can do a screen capture maybe. Yeah, so I think uh, I've taken some screen card, but uh, the three DMIs are not on the same page. <laughs> uh, it, it's okay. It's a record. It's actually recorded as a video. We can always yeah. extract the, you know, yeah, image that, that's fine yeah. from your camera we cannot see you both uh, uh you mean my camera uh yeah, if yeah, I... Yeah, and, uh, uh, yeah i yeah i can't sorry i'm not dressing very formally so uh, <laughs> you know because it's at midnight uh, okay. 
So yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I let me turn around, but my computer may be slow, so um, I will see how I go. Um, yes. Yeah, so I think uh, also our colleagues in Europe are also here, so they are. They can't wait for the workshop in Europe. <laughs> um, let me turn on my camera. I don't know if. Uh... Okay, finally. <laughs> okay, um, uh, let's uh, let me, I, let me just uh, take some screen card, and um, I think uh, Michael is also here from Spain, and uh, Cristiano I think is also here. I saw his name. A couple of. I, I, uh, think, I, I think I saw saw Roberto. Uh, oh, Roberto is here. Yes, yes. Yeah, was here. Yeah. They are ready for the next uh, next workshop yeah. now. Yeah. And a whole um, yeah yeah. And I hopefully, you know, for the for the sites, you know, the different universities, they, you know, they you guys can take a photo, uh, you know, in your classroom so that and then you can send it to, uh, uh, you know, the uh, I think who who's collecting Yang Yang will collect those uh, photos from the different sites. Yes, yes, I yeah. will collect that. And also, I I I think that we we plan to send send out a survey uh, to the participants. So you know, feel free to provide your feedback, and hopefully, we can improve our this workshop you know experience over the time. Yep. Yeah, I see still some questions haven't we haven't got enough time to answer. So maybe um um they, so you can uh, the attendees, uh, especially the students, they can put on uh, put the questions on the survey so that we can address from there. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. And I think that's it. Let's conclude yeah. the meeting. Mm -hmm. Bye. Okay, bye everybody. Okay, thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Mm -hmm.